Hey, what's up you guys? It's Stephanie Liu and welcome, 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 welcome. We've got a new episode for you on Lights Camera Live and this, this one is gonna be hilarious. I can already tell you that because Ben, we're already cracking jokes. And when we crack jokes, oh, you know it's gonna be good because you guys, guess what? This is gonna be confessions of an Emmy Award winning live streaming producer. What? So let's get ready for this. Let me go ahead and introduce you to the one, the only, Mr. Ben Ratner. What? Hey, how's it going? How are you? How you been? Doing good, doing good. Awesome, awesome. So for those of you who don't know, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Mr. Ratner over at VidCon, which was my first time attending. Have you been before? So this is my second VidCon, uh, so it was exciting to come back. And did you speak again? Uh, I was not speaking this year. Um, I was doing all sorts of different stuff that wasn't speaking. I was speaking to anyone who would listen to me, but nothing on a stage. How can no one listen to you? Oh my goodness. So hey, you guys, let me go ahead and first introduce you to Ben because this, this gentleman has a very, very amazing and interesting background that you should all be aware of. And he's like, oh my goodness, she's about to get into it. What did she find online? I found everything, Ben. I found everything. But there's some good stuff. <laughs> And some weird stuff. <laughs> That's very true. Okay, so Ben Ratner, he's a producer, a director, and a speaker, and he's worked with some of the most amazing brands out there. Currently at the moment, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are working with Neil deGrasse Tyson on Star Talk. Is that right? Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, yep. And you have also worked with Al Roker on Roker Media. Is that right? Yep, uh, it's Al Roker Entertainment. It's, it's his own private little production company. Um, and I was the head of live streaming there uh, while they were doing that. You're so funny. You said his own little private production. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, people think it's what happened. People think it's NBC. It's not NBC. And then I have to explain it. So it's his own production company. I love it. I love it. All right. So if you guys are tuning in, go ahead and let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm here in beautiful, sunny San Diego. I'm back home. Ben, you are in New York City. New York City. Whoop whoop. So. As in whoop whoop, shout out to Chad, who is tuning into the show. We've also got Mr. Mike Alton and Dean Reynolds tuning in. All right, Ben. So with this impressive background of yours, right, I always love reaching out to live streamers that are outside of the social media marketing circle because it's always nice to see what people outside of marketing are doing and how they got to be where they're at. So having said that, how did you fall into live streaming producer and director? Did you just wake up one day and were like, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do? Yeah, so what happened, this actually goes way, way back. I'm 27 now. Um, I first got interested in media and broadcasting when I was in middle school. Uh, we had a TV studio in my middle school somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I am just framed so cool right now. You are, um, did you see that? That was like a flip of the finger. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, I did my first live broadcast and we had a morning news show. That's where I learned all about, you know, TV and broadcasting. Um, fast forward to college, I did continue doing live broadcasting all that time. Um, while I was in high school and college, um, there was a public access station in town that just got a TriCaster. So I started doing um, my first kind of live broadcasting out of there with them. Um, and then, you know, college, college ended. My first job right out of school was at a company called uh, Compound Media. Uh, if you've heard of Opie and Anthony, um, that's Anthony Cumia's company. Um, he used to be kind of a radio shock jock, still is just not on Sirius XM anymore. Um, and there, I basically answered a Craigslist that said, come work for a talk show in a basement. Um, Wait. Not the best uh, <laughs> Wait a possible second. thing to do. Wait a second, come work for a talk show in a basement, and you're like, sure, I'll sign up for that. Hey, it paid nice. <laughs> I had no idea who Anthony was at the time. I knew nothing at that time. Um, but it, it was, you know, it was an interesting gig. It started, you know, two hours a day. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, and then what happened is over the next year and a half, we built from one two-hour show to a full 40-hour-a-week uh, talk show network, um, all live streamed, um, mostly behind a paywall. But that was really where I just started churning out live stuff constantly all the time, getting into interactivity, getting into some of the, you know, extra features you could do with live streaming and multicam. Yeah, um, yeah. So I did that for about a year and a half. Um, and then at that time, uh, Al Roker's production company was starting a wing of their company called Roker Media, which was focused on live streaming. Um, and this was before Facebook, um, Twitter came out with their APIs that let you do live streaming at a very kind of easy way. 
um, it was like just just getting started at that time. Yeah, that was back when Meerkat was that, like when Meerkat was the thing, the only thing. I was thinking, I was, I was like, wait, let's do the math here. So that's like when Blab, Meerkat, all that was still happening. Okay. Yeah, when when all of those things that you just said existed, um, and um, so then I, I reached out to them. This is the kind of thing I like doing. I love experimenting, um, and then I spent the next year with Alvaro Entertainment. Basically, we probably tested produced over 50 shows over the course of that year wow um, seeing what works in live streaming space we worked with a lot of kind of third-party apps and some of the networks themselves on features um trying to make really cool things um i did a really cool show there called uh, mario armstrong's never settle show uh, i have heard so much about that is that the one where you won the emmy for it that's that's where i won this guy oh my god wait 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 emmy. oh my god Emmy for interactivity. Oh, 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 where's my thing? There it is. You just, you, okay, you guys, this cracks me up because that's not the only thing that's on his desk, Ben. No, I have a telly too. And also, you know, a webby. That's awesome. I, I my webby is Conan O'Brien. Because you've worked with Conan too, right? I did intern with Conan, yep. Okay, well, I mean, but, but do you have your own bobblehead? I have. <laughs> okay, you know what? You, I don't have a bobblehead, but what I do have is a wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man that I ran out of battery for, so it won't flail for you. That's awesome. So Mike Alton says, "I would totally have those within arm reach always." Yes, Mike. I was yeah, telling. They're good for they're good for exercise. <laughs> you can kind of do... So so Mike, Ben and I were talking about. Okay, so like when you're. When you're speaking to a client and you're trying to tell the client all of the logistics and they start to kind of like poo-poo on your idea, do you just get like your awards and you're like, so, you know? <laughs> you know what? Actually, what's interesting is, um, let me let me just pull them back out. This one led to this one. Um, Facebook, um, for Facebook Watch, they were doing, they were starting to fund projects. Um, so when I was working at, uh, when well, I'm still working at, uh, Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, they said, pitch us a show. Um, we want it to be really interactive. We want it to be using all platforms features. Wow. Um, and I was like, okay, this is my jam. And then they showed me an example of the show that they wanted. And that was very hard shot in the resettle show, which of course I just won that Emmy for at that time. Uh, <laughs> New York Emmy. So I was like, yeah, that, that helped. And then we ended up winning a, uh, telly for that series which is pretty cool how do you even end up winning those awards do you submit it yourself or does the producer like who how does that even yeah, happen so mario's mario's team sent out for the emmy um i think it was kind of on a whim you know maybe it'll happen and he ended up getting nominated for two and uh, for host and for interactivity and we won for interactivity which was awesome um and then the other two the telly and the webby uh, i personally apply for uh, through the company um it's nice when you could have people to pay for those because these are, I mean, awards are great to have for a bunch of reasons, but they are also largely just really smart money-making operations because everyone wants an award. That so is true. it costs a couple hundred bucks to apply for each thing, for each category within each thing. Um, and then it costs you money to actually get these physical statues. What do you um, mean? So a lot of times you get one free statue if you win with your application. Um, but I could, you know, my Emmy cost like three fifty for me to buy. The Webby cost like five forty to buy. Um, so they, they, they do come at a cost in addition to actually winning. Oh, that is so funny. Yeah. I only knew of, um, the application fees and I was like, okay, so if you're going to do an application fee, like you really got to know your stuff and you got to make sure that your content actually leads up to like matches up with the criteria that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, but if, yeah, if you had like a big production team, then you would obviously want to get awards for every single person on the team, right? Yep. So, you know, sometimes you pay your own, sometimes they're nice enough to pay. It all depends on what's going on. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Actually, let me just show you one. I love this. What my favorite fact about the Emmy is at the bottom of the Emmy here. Let's see if you can read it there. What it says is basically, if you die, um, you're, the people who you leave this to can't sell it. And if they don't want it, they have to give it back to the Academy. Really? Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Okay, so if you guys are just tuning in, this is Confessions of an Emmy Award winning live streaming producer, and that is Mr. Ben Ratner. And so we've talked so far about how he first got started into live streaming and just being a video producer and how that led to some really amazing projects with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who you're still working with for Star Talk. Yeah, I'm still working with him. I got him right. Oh, like, wait a second. Are you gonna bring him out? Like, 
Back over here. That's, You'll get the bottom of Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's funny. Okay, so then, um, so then, is that the only show that you're working on? Or are you still doing other projects? Like, what's up? So I do some freelancing. We're actually getting uh, getting back into the the beat uh, for season three of the Never Settle Show, which is very exciting. We'll be working with Nasdaq again on that. Um, cool. And you know, when uh, I do a bunch of freelancing, consulting, whatever comes up, um, I like um, I just like talking about this stuff, so it's fun. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's not even work when it's so much fun and you're super passionate about it. So then I'm curious, what's your gear? Like, what are you using for, for both of your shows? Yeah, so we're lucky enough for the Never Settle show this season um, to be working out of NASDAQ studio. So it's a full, complete, you know, TV production studio. Um, you know, everything's very expensive there. But season one of the Never Settle show, um, we really just bootstrapped that. We had a TriCaster. We, we brought in a bunch of cameras. Um, we were streaming through a live view. We, we literally had to bring in the entire studio every single week. Um, so it was a nice upgrade to start working at the Never Settle at, at the uh, NASDAQ studio. What? That is crazy. Okay, so when does the when does the new show launch? When does that happen? Um, I, it is, I don't know an exact date, but definitely sometime before the end of the year, uh, you should be seeing a couple episodes of the Never Settle show. Awesome. So, how many people are actually on the team? So, when you're when you're live streaming Never Settle, how many people are actually there? Yeah. So, Never Settle um, season one, um, we had someone basically at every crew position, including cameras and everything. We had over forty people on the technical crew for that before you even got to the social media and all the other producers and stuff. Um, this this year, uh, since we started working at Nasdaq, it's a more consolidated crew just because the equipment allows for it. So, we're using all robotic cameras. So we just have one camera operator. We have one audio person, I think, and an audio assistant. You know, a graphics person, a director, a TD. There's probably like 10 or so people on the tech side that are keeping everything together. That is crazy. And so, I mean, they're all on payroll, obviously? Yep. Yeah, no, they're, they're very good about all of that. That is very cool. Awesome, awesome. What is, um, what is one of the most embarrassing things that have ever happened during one of your live streams? I could tell you the worst the worst thing that's ever happened to me on a live stream. I would love to know that. Have, have you ever heard of the McDonald's McRib Variety Spectacular? No. That is correct. Why? McDonald's came to us, asked us to do the McDonald's McRib Variety Spectacular. Well, they, they wanted us to do something with the McRib when I was at Roker. They wanted us to do some sort of live stream for the McRib coming back in California. So I pitched them that idea. They liked it. Um, we got to, to the venue, just no internet. I did not think about getting the right amount of bandwidth. The most interesting, and there was almost no cellular in the area. It was an absolute disaster. Um, so we ended up renting, this is the first time I ever used a bonded cellular, um, which is um, at the time we used the Teradect Live View. Uh, you may have talked about these things on the show before. Yeah. Um, so we rented the Teradect, and then the rental people did not um, renew their contract so it ended at noon, the day of the broadcast, for a one o'clock broadcast. No! So my, backup, my backup to my backup failed in front of all the McDonald's execs. It was a, it was a nightmare. So that was that was the begin. That was the last time I ever worked without my own live view or without really, really being confident that the band was on site, because that was just like the worst thing that could have happened. Oh, that is, and especially when you have a backup plan for your backup plan, and then that falls through. So I. Yeah. I'm familiar with Live View, but I would love to get your take on Live View. Even, yeah, even if you have it on hand, just to tell yeah, people I, what it is and why is it so useful and how you use sure. it. I, I should say that uh, they were kind enough to give me this one for free. I do some events with them. Um, this costs about a thousand bucks for a Live View solo, and then there's a monthly charge for it. Um, but basically, what this does is it takes multiple cellular cards, um, so just really off-the-shelf, you know, modems for your cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, you can do up to uh, two uh, hardwired, and then um, Ethernet um, and Wi-Fi. It takes all those signals, puts them together um, up in the cloud. So it's basically sending your your video signal up to four times um, to make sure that you have the redundancy in your stream. And if Verizon's not doing great, you get a Verizon and an AT&T card, let's say. If AT&T is better in that area, it'll put more of that weight onto AT&T. Hi, Chris Strub. You were just talking about the <laughs> um, uh, So, um, yeah, it, it's basically a really reliable way to have internet wherever you are, um, as long as there is even moderate cellular service. 
So, um, I use this even when there's Ethernet at a venue um, because I'm in control of this. Yeah. Uh, I am not in control of a venue's Ethernet. No, so, yeah, because then like other people could be on the concept. same same Ethernet and, and all of that good stuff. So it's kind of yeah. like Live View is like the it's like the Transformers. They all come together and they make like the big like yeah. bandwidth ever. That's awesome. Uh, the way I talk about this to techies, if you work in post-production or editing and you know what a RAID system is, it, it basically works in a similar way where it's putting more than it's more than a single camera signal on one card. So you can actually pull out one of your cards during the broadcast and the entire broadcast is still safe on the other card. Wow. Um, now, if that one goes down, then you have a problem. But the point is with multiple with multiple streams, multiple sources of bandwidth, you get a lot of extra redundancy that you don't get running off of just your cell phone or just a single Ethernet cable even. Well, that's brilliant. That's awesome. And so is that something that you could just order online? Do you have to meet them yeah, at a conference? Yeah, you could literally, you could even order this thing on Amazon. You could, uh, you might even be able to buy it like at B&H stores. You, you can get these things anywhere. Really? Um, and then, yeah, you literally just, you get the, uh, the cellular cards off the shelf. If you even have them already, you can use existing ones. Uh, you could even use like the Wi-Fi from your phone as an extra source, um, so you can really uh, go go far with it. And, and so, so to be clear, because I know the Live View connects through in like an HDMI cable or, or into an external camera. Yep. Right. So yeah, they make units that work on HDI, uh, HDI, uh, HDMI, and SDI. Okay, cool. So it's not like you could just take your smartphone and plug it into that. No, right. Um, you actually can. You can get Whoa. a output from your smartphone via uh, Lightning or through USB-C and go right into a uh, Live View if you want. In See? fact, what a lot of people do, um, there's software called Switcher Studio, for example, uh, where it's like a multi-cam uh, thing. It lets you use multiple cell phones and put graphics and switch cameras, all that stuff. Take that output, put it into a Live View solo. You have an incredibly portable multi-camera, high production quality solution right off the bat. I love it because Chris Treb, who's obviously watching the show right now, um, he works with Switcher Stu Studio a lot. And I've actually used Switcher Studio for one of my other clients when I had to connect like eight different iPads. Um, are you still using Switcher Studio or are you more on your like Terra Deck, like TriCaster? So, so most of my work is TriCaster work nowadays or single camera stuff um, where I do a lot of stuff in the cloud now. I used to use Depresso a lot. I, you know, there's a whole bunch of cloud services um, that let you add video, graphics, et cetera. Um, so it really just depends on the gig. For the right thing, yeah, I'll still use Switcher Studio for sure. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, so if you guys have any questions about any of Ben's gears, any of that good stuff, by all means, drop them in the comments because this is probably the only time that you're going to get a hold of Ben. Let's be honest. Because this man is very busy and he's got another show that's coming up. <laughs> yeah, but I also spend way too much time on Twitter. So, like, I'm going to ask questions there too. So is, is Twitter the best place to, to get a hold of you? I spend more of my day on Twitter than I spend a week. Wow. That, that sounds like that's even more than Mr. Chris Trubb. So we'll have to see about that. It's like a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. All right. So what are your tips on how to make a scroll stopping Emmy eligible live stream? Like what are your tips for that? Yeah, my tips are um, to me the biggest thing in, in addition to the basics of having it look sound uh, and broadcast well. So, and we can talk a little bit about you know what makes good video, what makes good audio, what makes good bandwidth. Um, but to me, it's using the platform as it was intended to be used and treating the audience like they expect to be treated. Mm. Um, so this is you know you you want to ask why are you live streaming this? It's possible that what you're doing live streaming might, might not be even the best option for it, but you can use a lot of live streaming workflows uh, and technologies to make even a regular video happen. Yeah. Um, uh, like to me, a, a premiere on Facebook or YouTube is essentially a live stream, but there's a lot of benefits to doing something not necessarily live, but again, using your live workflow. And the, to the audience, it's still happening in real time. So for all intents and purposes, it is live. Um, but on things like Facebook, use the platform features, you know, look at comments, you know, look at recommended videos, see how, see how audience interactivity works on that platform. See what the APIs let you do, see if you can bring in third-party software that let you really, you know, treat your platform the way it was meant to be treated. Um, and also, the more you treat the platform the way the platform wants you to treat it, um, in general, you get kind of algorithmic juice on those things. Um, so back when Facebook was pushing live streaming, yeah. boy, you wanted to be live streaming all the time. When they had new features, like, you know, they, they added polling a, little, a couple months, years ago, whatever it was, the more of those, you know, you get more of a chance of those things being shared throughout people's feeds. 
Um, so, so take a look at what they are excited about and do that. Oh, interesting. So it's like if they roll out a new future, a feature, be one of the first early adopters to test it out because they want to have some type of case study to share and show other people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. They want, they want. First of all, they want to see that it's working and working nicely. Um, and there's some product manager that is super excited about this thing. Um, <laughs> there's some product they, manager. They fought, they fought hard for this thing to to make it into the platform. And you know, whatever promotion they're doing to make it happen, be it a notification or extra weight in your in your timelines or whatever. Um, so make those people happy, and they'll make you happy. Oh, that's so funny. Because that is true. Have you ever gone to Facebook F8? The developer conference? I haven't gone to F8 yet. Okay. But what you're saying is true because I've gone and in like the garage that they have, they have like the actual product lead for that specific product that they've developed. And as soon as you start geeking out with them about how you're using the product that they've been developing their teams for so long, they become really, really interested. They'll start to open up and answer all of your questions. So I love, 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 love that you brought that up. But aside from features, isn't there, shouldn't there be some structure to a show? Yeah, there, you know, I, I actually look a lot to traditional shows, you know, things you might even see on broadcast television for a live stream, because this has been done for, you know, 90 years of, you know, not 90, 70 years of TV, you know, almost 100 years of radio broadcast. Um, there are structures that people like, content is always king. Yeah. Um, you, you look at some of the most successful shows now, like Facebook's uh, Red Table Talk. Um, it's, it's largely a traditional talk show yeah. on Facebook. Um, so, so look to the past to see what, you know, what can work because these things have been working forever. Um, live streaming is just another tool in your toolbox. Yes, it has extra interactivity. It has certain extra things that you need to think about, but what everyone else has already done, there's a lot, no need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, that's, that, that's so true. And then, um, my goodness, I, I feel like there's so many questions that I want to throw at you, but Hey, if you guys have any questions, well, here, here, by all here, means, here's something. Yeah. There's something specific that you could really only do nowadays with a platform like Facebook or YouTube. Um, live metrics. You can, in real time, be running analytics and seeing how many people are watching, uh, retention, if they're dropping off. Um, these are things that can tell you if your segment should be longer and shorter. Um, that, you know, you could, it's a cost a lot of money to do that in TV, you get your minute by minute ratings. But even that usually comes after the fact. Um, so if you take advantage of that, you can really cater to what your specific audience is looking for. Oh, I love that. And so, so for you and your role, how much are you a part of the show? Are you just there for, for, are you there like for planning, for production, for editing, repurposing, for marketing? Like how involved are you? I try to be involved in every stage of the process. I, um, I started as a tech person and I realized I enjoyed producing. But throughout the last five or so years, because of being oftentimes the only person in charge of a production or the only person hired to do a specific kind of thing, um, I end up in all phases of the process. And I've realized that having your tech person understand the content uh, means that they can tell you, oh, we can actually do this technical thing to make that cooler or work. Or yeah. I have this cool technical thing. Is there something that you might want to do that, that suits that from a content perspective? Um, and then I could tell you, you know, because of the understanding I have the social networks and how all those things work, I could say, well, if you clip this thing or do this for after the fact, it'll actually help to bring more people, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, so you should have a technical kind of streaming type person at every, every, step, of the, every step of your production. Um, I love that. To make sure that you can really integrate well. I love that. Okay, so Chris has a question for you. And Chris says, uh, Ben, how do you balance the traditional game plan with incorporating live engagement? Yep, um, so a big part of that is testing it out. You have to see what your audience can handle. Um, is your audience you know, a younger millennial, millennial audience that's super interested in interactivity? Are they older people that see that going through their timeline and they just wanna watch the damn thing? Um, you know, are they watching on mobile compared to desktop? Is there a play, you know, are, is the ways in which they can interact um, easy? Is it hard? What's the barrier to entry for interactivity? Yeah. Um, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Because honestly, there, I would say that there's kind of two buckets uh, of, of live streaming on social networks. You have your one-way stuff and you have your two-way stuff. One-way yeah. stuff isn't bad. That's just taking a, you know, a show and broadcasting in real time. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole lot of benefits to that. There's the community engagement on the side. You don't necessarily need to interact with them to make it a, an engaging experience that's better than just watching on TV. 
uh, before live streaming, people were live tweeting shows. That's something that people like, love to do. It's that second screen experience that you're just taking a little more control over. Yeah. Um, and then if you want something truly interactive, you want to ask, first of all, does it need to be interactive? Are there benefits to being interactive? Because I yeah. see a lot of people live streaming for the sake of live streaming. Um, and that made sense for sure back when it was being pushed by Facebook, Twitter, by these people who really wanted it to, to take off. Yeah. And that was great at the time. Nowadays, you know, you don't get those notifications for every single stream. You don't get the same kind of uh, algorithm boost just for having a trillion comments in your stream. Mm -hmm. um, so it should really complement and suit what you're working on. And if it doesn't, either try something else or don't do that interactivity at all. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's contrary to what you hear a lot because people get really excited about it and that's been the rule for years. But you need to just test and see what your audience is interested in and what really suits your content the best. And when you say interactivity, aside from like showing the comments on the screen, doing intros, outros, and all that, all that stuff, um, are there? Uh, do you do like interactive polls in your in any of your live streams? Like, so so there's there, yeah things like polls in the live stream, things like looking in the comments, not necessarily putting them up, but seeing the feel, what people are talking about, if there is relevant topics to bring up. But there's also interactivity before your broadcast. Yes. Um, finding out what to talk, talk about beforehand, people sending you things that they want to talk about. Um, we, we'll do like photo contests before when we did the Wheel of Science series um, with Star Talk. Um, interactivity isn't just during that broadcast. I love that. Oh my gosh. Can you please repeat that for the people in the back? <laughs> interactivity is not just for the broadcast. Uh, it is before, during, after. It's even in pre-production before you're in the before the broadcast version, so. There you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because <laughs> that's one of the things that most people think about. They're just like, oh, well, I'm just gonna go live and then we'll, we'll see what happens. And then some people just kind of stop because they realize, well, no one showed up. It's like, well, if no one knows, how can they go and how can they show up? So what's your kind of like promotional plan for your shows? How do you get people buzzing about it before they before you actually go live? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of scheduled broadcasts. I'm a big fan of just promoting on social media, promoting before, during, and especially during, you know, as you come up with a new topic, send out a new tweet about that thing. Put out a, not necessarily a Facebook post, but maybe in the comments, pin a new comment on Facebook that says, now we're talking about this thing. Yeah. Uh, those, those are the kinds of things that I, I feel work pretty well. I see some people do events. I don't really see a whole lot of, to me, it's a second step in the chain. Yeah. That just, you know, I'd rather them RSVP to that broadcast on the actual broadcast itself. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that, and I understand that. One of the one of the reasons why, like, I do an event for the show is because if I know someone RSVP'd for the previous Instagram event, like, let's say with Jen Herman, and I know that Instagram, you know, is going to drop up drop something new, then I could always reinvite them to the next one. And it's fun for advertising, so that's always good, too. So Mike Alton loved your comment, too. Interactivity is not just for the broadcast. So yes, 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 yes. All right, so let's talk about um, what are some, how, where do you find your ideas? How do you say, like, okay, Wheel of Science and all these other cool things? Where do you come up with those ideas? Yeah, so, so a lot of things just come up randomly as jokes and calls, uh, but then we're like, oh, maybe we should take that a little more seriously. <laughs> uh, this one wasn't a live stream, but uh, for July 4th this year, this is probably two weeks before July 4th for Star Talk. Um, we were on a call. Um, they said we might be able to do something with uh, Takaro Kobayashi. Uh, if you don't know, he won the uh, Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest a million years. He used to be the biggest thing, and then he got kicked out of the competition. It was a whole dirty, disastrous thing. Now he doesn't get along with Nathan and started his own thing. Wow. So uh, my thought process was, well, what would be something we could do with him that we could counter-program to the actual July 4th Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, which in, it, it's big in New York. I don't know how big it is elsewhere. But, yeah. you know, they eat like 50 hot dogs in 10 minutes. It's nuts. <laughs> so I said, what would be the weirdest thing to counter-program that with? Okay. And I just thought, what if we just had the world's fastest hot dog eater eat a single hot dog for 10 minutes? So so we, just had, we just had him drag out the eating of a hot dog. Um, and it was just a throwaway <laughs> comment that became just this kind of hilarious, you know, viral potentially type thing because it was just so obscure. <laughs> that is hilarious. Okay, so then like, 
What did he do? Okay, because I'm in in my head, I'm envisioning he's either holding this teeny hot dog and he's trying to eat it very slowly, or he took it up a notch and he got like a fork and a knife and he's oh, slowly. Oh, there was a fork and a knife. He was slowly doing it. He was sniffing it. He was really, for the first time, just like savoring food in his mouth, trying all the condiments, the whole thing. This, oh. but the, the, the worst thing about this, though, it was a really fun day and everything. We go out. This is July 3rd, 2019. Do you remember anything that happened on the internet on July 3rd, 2019? When you say the internet, I don't know why I, I automatically thought of like Kim Kardashian breaking the internet. I don't know. You tell me. Well, your, your second half of that is correct. That is the day that Facebook and Instagram completely went down this year for like 12 hours. Oh. So our main day of distribution just completely went away because we, we couldn't post the thing. Oh, uh, we no. ended up being pretty good with it on Twitter, but it was just one of those like, damn it, internet. Yeah. So, okay. And, that, and so that's a good segue. <laughs> what do you do then if like your primary Facebook platform is gone? Like what other, what are your, what's your default? Where do you go to? Twitter? Yeah, um, YouTube? You need to think about the audiences that you have um, and see if it's even worthwhile to do it elsewhere. Um, if you have only created a Facebook audience, you know, depending, depending on the stakes of your broadcast, um, it may make sense not to broadcast it live and then just put it up on demand later. In fact, that's what we did with the McDonald's stream. Um, we couldn't, we just couldn't broadcast it. I recorded it, went back to the hotel room a couple hours later, and then we were able to put it up that way. But yeah. it didn't have, you know, it was it was late. The timing was off for oh. a bunch of reasons that didn't quite work. But at least, you know, to me, I'd rather get to that same audience, even if it's a little bit later in the day. Yeah, that makes sense. Were you like, when, so when that happened with the whole McDonald's thing, were you just kind of like, I am in my cave, I am in my hotel room, do not talk to me? Were you like totally golem? <laughs> it was, uh, that was not a good day in my life. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. I've got a freaking Emmy. That is true. I mean, yeah, I mean, you cannot, I would imagine that you wake up every morning just feeling like the bomb.com, right? Yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah. I, I, not sure if I give myself those adjectives. <laughs> okay, so then other ways that you spark your creativity it starts off in like email chains, uh, you know, jokes. Like any, are there programs that you watch that you're just like, hey, I would love to see how I could translate that into live video. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a big fan of talk shows. Um, you know, I'm a big Colbert. You know, the, 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 uh, Conan, those kinds of fans, um, and everything they do, I always think, how is that going to work for the talent that I'm working with? Mm. Um, and it's kind of a, a mesh of that. And a lot of time it comes from talking with the talent, see if they have something that they've wanted to do and just haven't had the platform to do or haven't had the resources to do. Um, what I find a lot nowadays is that, especially with older people, um, they don't realize that this stuff is free, easy, you know, low barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, so I, I do a whole lot of just bringing people's ideas to life in ways they didn't realize could happen. And I don't blame them necessarily because it's only been about five or so years since this stuff was at the level and efficiency that you can do this way. And live streaming, we're really only talking three, three and a half years mm -hmm. um, of API, RTMP, you know, social network based streaming. Yeah. Um, so we're still new in the game, but, you know, getting them aware of the things that you can do is really, really just excellent. That's cool. Yeah. You know, usually when I when I sit down with a the client, they're like, hey, so Stephanie, we want to do this live stream. What can we do? Usually the first question is like, well, what are you imagining? And I'd rather just have them like word vomit everything that they want to do and not limit their imaginations and just like be creative instead of just trying to put them in a box and be like, oh, well, you know, you could do this. Here's package A, package B. Like, how do you yes. approach it? Um, well, let me, let me give you an example with Mario, with Mario's show. So I met Mario at a meetup. It was like a future of TV meetup, or I heard about him at a meetup. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I did a stream when I was a Roker. It was with Al and it was with Gary Vaynerchuk. And then Mario was in those comments there. And he was like, oh, how did you do that? Super cool. At that time, I don't think he even saw live streaming multicam because we were one of the first people to be able to do it. Wow. Um, and then he told me the story about how he's been trying to do the show forever. He's got rejected in the networks, yada, yada. And I said, well, why don't we just do this thing dirt cheap with a TriCaster, a couple cameras? You know, there's there's almost no barrier to entry here. Yeah. And that was what got him going. That, that was really the way that, you know, his lifelong dream was able to happen all of a sudden just because, you know, someone made him aware that it was possible. That um, it's an option. Yeah. That it's an option. And then, you know, the questions are, how much do you want to spend? 
you know, we can do this thing with one camera. We can do it with eight cameras. We did it with eight cameras. Yeah. Um, next year, you know, we, we were able to create partnerships for better studio, that kind of thing. Another example of this is um, a show we did called Bold. Um, it's still on the air right now. It's kind of like a morning show for millennials news show kind of thing. Uh, Carrie Sheffield is the founder. She's one of those talking heads on cable you see a lot. She wanted to have kind of this, her kind of news show. Uh, they, they brought her into Roker. Again, mm -hmm. this is possible. We can shoot it at this studio here, which actually was the studio um, where I uh, that I built for Compound Media and Anthony. Wow. Um, that went out. But we said, all we need to do is plug you into this. It's here. It's ready to go. Um, let's figure out what the content is and how to make this thing work. Um, so just having access to knowing this stuff makes all the difference in the world. And so then, so you know everything about the tech, obviously, and you're wicked smart about that. How involved are you in the... Um content ideation process like are you usually involved in just for like oh this is one show that we want to do or are you are you sitting at the table and you're like we want to create a series we want to create a show with more than one episode yes yeah, so those are the conversations i have i try to get again involved in these conversations as soon as possible and make sure i stay in them as long as possible um and yeah things like is it a one-off is it a series is it monthly is it weekly those are like some basic things that you know i understand as a tech person what it takes to get that done. Um, and I also understand, you know, we can be flexible with that. We can try it daily. We can try it weekly. We can see how the audiences interact. Um, so it, it, you know, it depends on budget. It depends on availability. Um, and it depends on audience. I mean, those are all things that you need to take into account when you do this kind of thing. That is so um, And I'm just, I'm a randomly creative person sometimes. So I try to throw out ideas. Um, it's it's sometimes hard to get uh, producers and, and companies to realize that a tech person can have ideas, but I'm a person. I watch a lot of stuff. I see a lot of stuff. Um, there's there's not a whole bunch of original stuff out there. Everything's a take on something else. There's yeah. eight shows with comedians and cars right now. Um, so you know you, you find your take, your perspective on something that already works great, or something that someone else isn't doing great that you know you can make great. Um, and I try to encourage these people to do these kinds of things because there's just so much opportunity with the, with the you know the barrier to entry to all of this. Oh, I love that. I love that. And so Mike Alton is already just jotting notes down furiously as he's getting ready to drop a new show next week. So like I love like this was like the perfect timing. This was very serendipitous. Um, Mike, we're doing this for you. <laughs> yeah, this is Stephanie this is for you, Mike. Said, Mike's doing a show next week. What can you make him write ferocious notes on? Exactly. So Mike's doing this show next week. So I need you to come on the show. <laughs> so okay. So we've talked about different studios. Does everything have to be in a fancy studio? Oh, no. Almost nothing does. I mean, a lot of single camera streams. There's a lot you can do with those. You can. Uh, from your phone nowadays, you can even add graphics, you can roll, cut to video, um, you can add lower thirds, um, you can start and stop your stream, you can throw comments on screen. Um, there's plenty of apps that do that. There's also a lot of cloud apps. Um, even just going from your laptop, people don't, uh, just because of the, the live streaming started on mobile yes. for social streaming, worked its way to computers via RTMP and sending stuff to Facebook. But only in the last like even year or two, um, did they open up webcams to live streaming? That's where things like Ecamm became really popular, oh my God. but only recently. Um, so you can do a pretty solid live stream just just like you're doing right now. You're using cloud software. You're using you're using things that make this a more than engaging stream. Um, what I what I get really excited about is the future of kind of remote broadcasting. Um, a lot of people call it Remy broadcasting, remote um, at home broadcasting. Um, tell me more about that. A, yeah, tell me more about so that. It's basically camera in one location, broadcast from that location, producer somewhere else, your live stream producer, everyone else somewhere else. Um, it means that, you know, if I were to, if I were to be a, you know, a talk show host in Missoula, but, uh, but your engineer could be in New York where there's a lot of TV people. Um, it's a, it's an excellent way to get the talent that you want to get the crew that you want without having to be on site. And you can do this with multiple cameras. Um, you could even send live view signals up into the cloud, bring them back down, and you can either use cloud software, Stage 10, Vidpresso, um, or you could bring it back into like a TriCast or your, your existing control room setting. Yeah. Um, and that's a way just to take even basic camera stuff from a cell phone and turn it into a whole live broadcast. There's this show, um, Live PD, 
which is kind of the extreme example of this. It's on A and E Friday nights from uh, Friday and Saturdays from nine to midnight. Uh-huh. They use um, they use bonded cellular, and they have uh, thirty cameras in eight precincts around the country, um, and they're doing basically a live version of the show Cops. Um, but that's the extreme version of what you can do at home. I mean, we're two people talking, and then you're, you're throwing up comments and stuff. That's you know, it's all the same thing, just at different levels. That it's wait, it's a live cop chasing show. Is that what you just said, or did I just yeah, make that up? It's surprisingly addicting. It's yeah, it's like a. It's, they're not chasing cops; they're chasing criminals or or not criminals, depending on uh, who they end up getting. Oh, that's so. See, I'm a cord cutter, but now you've actually just got me interested in into like, oh, okay, I want to check this out. Is that available it's like the online? Number, it's it's um, I mean, only on you know streaming, you know, like slang things like that. Yeah, they put clips up online. Um, but this is this actually goes to the value of live. Uh, this is the number one show on cable on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, it beats out sometimes it beats out football. Like it's uh, it, it's that kind of because it's live. You don't know what's happening next. Yeah. Um, it's it's got that value. Oh my gosh! I mean, how did okay? You're talking about cops, criminals, legal plus live streaming. I feel like that is like the epic. That could be the. <laughs> be the craziest show ever how do you get yeah, away actually, with all so, well there's so that particular show it's under the guise of news and live broadcasting and okay. basically open sourcing okay. um so that's kind of how they get away with it but the, the reason that show started the reason that the creator came up with that show is um years ago people uh, cops started to live stream um uh, some of their pursuits some of the, just randomly throughout the day to show what it was like to be a cop um, this is around a lot of the kind of controversy around cops. Um, and they were trying to, you know, live streaming lets you create your own narrative. You're your own content producer. Um, so they saw what that was doing. It's obviously engaging because um, you don't know what's going to happen next, but also just brings you into everyone's lives. Um, this is very popular on Twitch. You have IRL streamers and real life streamers that just, you know, follow you, that, that you know, you follow them their entire day just because people are interesting. Um, and then, you know, they were able to transition that from Periscope to, you know, actual TV broadcasts. Wow. Okay. So you and Chris, by the way, I feel like are, are, have you guys met? Have you not met? I, we, we have met on a couple of occasions. Okay. Yes. okay. Cause I'm like, you two need to meet you. You both love Twitter and this, this live PD thing, which I think is absolutely hilarious. One question that Tim Stone has for you, Ben, is have you heard of StreamYard? Have you heard of that live streaming platform? I have not used StreamYard. Uh, what I will say is more and more of these pop up all the time. Some are getting bigger, some are consolidating. Um, there, you know, I, I don't know exactly what StreamYard is. I know what the features are that I'm looking for in any project that I do. And then I look to see what platforms are using those well, uh, which ones aren't necessarily using those as well, which one have the correct combination of things that I need. Yeah. Um, and then usually put together patchwork for each project. Do you, okay, and I have been wishing for this for so long and I might just break down and create it myself, but do you have like a cheat sheet that says this platform has all of these features and this one has all of these features and... You know what, back when I was at Roker, I, I had that, I did that, things changed too rapidly, I, I just don't have time. I know. Um, which is every time I start a project, I look at my go-tos um, and then I look to see, uh, you know, what are they doing now? Yeah. Um, and then also what has Facebook broken because they want to be annoying with their API rules. So like I, you know, I, I, um, I what was it, what is it I use for, uh, not restream. Um, uh, what's the other one that does the restream? Uh, switcher? Switchboard live. Yeah. Um, so I do switchboard for, um, streaming to multiple platforms. And all of a sudden Facebook said, Hey, you can't do that. If you're going to stream to Facebook, you, you could only stream to Facebook and nowhere else. Um, so they caught on to that, but only on Switchboard, not on Restream. Well, no, no, no. Everyone had to deal with it. So basically, oh. I, I don't, I haven't checked recently, but um, you have to do RTMP streams to get around that, basically, instead of API streams. Yeah. So you know, it's just one of those things that things are constantly changing. Yeah. So you have to stay on top of it consistently yeah. because everything is always evolving. Hey, you guys, if you're loving the show as much as I am, because I've I've completely geeked out with Ben. By all means, go ahead and drop them in the comments because otherwise Chris is going to talk all about live PD. <laughs> also in the comments, write quotes about things that I didn't say. I want to see if we could just just incredibly fake facts about live streaming. Fake facts about live <laughs> Let's see those in the comments. 
<laughs> what would you say to someone that's still on the fence about like, oh, I don't like the sound of my voice. I don't know how I look on camera. I shouldn't do live video. What do you, what do you usually say? Uh, what do I say? First of all, what, what, what I like about a lot of uh, people expect that like it's going to feel like you're, you know, like you're selling at the Beacon Theater and you have to talk in front of 3,500 people. Yeah. Think about that you're just talking to the webcam, you know, to one person on the end. Um, in fact, I often suggest a co-host in those situations, someone you can toss off of, someone you could talk to, because um, that can help you kind of feel like you're in a smaller, easier situation. Ah, uh, I like that. I like that. Here's another question from you from Miss Amanda Robinson. She's saying, what's the difference between RTMP streams and API streams? Sure. RTMP is the protocol by which live streaming works. So you're always actually somehow using, at least if you're streaming from a computer, uh, for the most part, uh, RTMP. Uh, it's the thing that takes basically your video, brings it from your source to your destination, mm -hmm. or at least to the cloud where it gets turned into another format. Um, an API uses RTMP, um, but also adds on features. So when you start your Facebook stream from, let's say something like Switchboard or something like Vidpresso or something like, I bet you, uh, whatever, whatever service you mentioned, they're, they're digging into the API. So basically Facebook is giving them access to their features and says, you can use these, you use this magic code to connect to that and you can put this into your software or your hardware. Mm. So right now you're using, um, what are you using to do Skype for this? Yeah. Are you using Ecamm? Skype so and Ecamm, Ecamm, yep. Skype and Ecamm are going to Facebook and saying, I want to stream live. Um, so here's the button that lets you go live. Here's the thing that lets you collect your comments and here's the thing that lets you put them on screen. So, so all of that is basically using platform features that Facebook provides. Um, and APIs have a lot of things that you might not even know about. It lets you get things like analytics. It lets you get um, you know, things like profile pictures, all sorts of stuff that you could dig into these things with. Got it. Okay, here's another one from Jim. Ben says to use an avatar if you have a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's only, only half a joke. Uh, there is software called Adobe Character Animator that lets you in real time animate yourself. What? Um, they, did, they did this with a live episode of The Simpsons. If you watch Colbert, uh, if you've seen cartoon Donald Trump, uh, that was actually a live person sitting in front of a camera as he's being animated. Um, you, you set up your, your face, you set up your body, um, and then it, it motion tracks you. Um, and it gives you the, the talking lips, it, it follows your eyes around. And yeah. You can actually do live streaming animation. What? That is so cool. Are you, do you plan on doing any of that stuff anytime soon? I don't always have a need for that, but you know, occasionally <laughs> you do something fun with it. All right, Chris Strub says, can you give us a fake fact about Mario and Nicole Armstrong? Yeah, they can fly. <laughs> Because their arms are strong. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so Amanda says, thank you, Ben. Very, very helpful. Yeah, see, this is why you needed to meet Ben. Ben is awesome. Hey, you know what, Amanda, you jumped on late, so I don't think you actually saw his Emmy. Can you show her your Emmy again? Uh, there it is. <laughs> Sometimes, until I got, I just got this Webby a couple weeks ago, but I used to have Conan, whoops, I used to have Conan just kind of sitting up here in the, in the, in the Emmy. That's awesome. Because when you have Webbies, you're like obligated to do weird things with them. Why are you obligated to do weird things with them? Because everyone, like once you get an Emmy, is it, how do you use it? Do you put it on display? Is it a paperweight? Do you put it in your bathroom? Is it like something that you use to poke people with? Like you got to find a good use for your Emmy. I feel like I feel like there should be a spoof of you like on the subway, just like poking people like, oh, I'm sorry. Did my Emmy just poke you? Just <laughs> oh, that'll, that'll go well. Is that an Emmy? Or but I know. Exactly. They'll probably take it away from you. Like, you see that bottom inscription on the very bottom? It says no poking on the subway. Cool, cool, cool. So let's, one last question, because you've been so gracious with your time, is for those that are interested in submitting their shows to award submission sites, what yeah. should you look for? Because do they always give you the criteria for what they're looking for as they're judging nominations? If you're paying like 300 to $500 per submission, I mean, you got to be smart about it, right? Yeah, so look to last year's winners and the year before. Those are always up. Um, so see the kinds of people that won in the past. When I submitted us for this Telly Award for, for the Wheel of Science series with StarTalk, um, I could have put us in the science category. I could have put us in the interactive category. So I looked to see the one that fit better based off of the people who applied last year uh, and also said, I think I could be these, but I can't be these. Um, so that's kind of my strategy for choosing where to go. 
Yeah. And then the question as to which awards in general to go for. Yeah. Um, my philosophy on awards is they're, they're important to the people that think they're cool and they're meaningless and expensive to the people that don't. Um, Emmy is a very strong category. Everyone knows an Emmy. Even though mine is just a New York regional Emmy, um, there's tremendous marketing value to that to me. Um, yeah. I've gotten business because people see an Emmy or I can poke them with an Emmy. Um, <laughs> You know, Webby's, a lot of people know the Webby Awards. A lot of people know the Telly Awards. But there's just a whole bunch of these kind of like money-sucking awards that not a lot of people know about. Easy to win. If you want some hardware on your desk, that's great. Um, but I don't necessarily find the same value to those as a producer, as someone who's going out for new business. Got um, it. So make sure that – and only push these things to people that are going to be interested. If if this per, you know, if you're talking to someone who's not in the media industry, don't show them a Webby. They, they, it's. I've got to say, first of all, the dumbest looking statue of all of them. <laughs> um, Stop! Don't, like, don't say that. We will trim that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, web, no. But, but in the media industry, Webbies are incredibly cool. If you work in digital media, you know what a Webby is. Um, so you know there's value in that for media industry, but there's not going to be value in that if you're doing a live stream for a doctor's office. Um, yeah. So kind of pick and choose the things that you want to go for, and think about the reasons that you want to use them in your life. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, Ben, I this I, it's been a while since I've live streamed, and I can't believe how much I've laughed. So <laughs> thank you so much for just being such an informative guest, completely, absolutely entertaining. How can people just stay in touch with you because you're doing some kick-ass stuff? What do you? How do they keep yeah, in touch? Yeah, best thing, follow me over on Twitter uh, at Ben Makes TV. Um, I spend again way too much time there, um, so happy to answer any questions over there. And so Light PD is tomorrow, Friday? Friday, Friday and Saturday nights on A&E, 9 will, p.m. Eastern. Will you and Chris be like live tweeting that? Yeah, it depends if I'm, uh, I should be watching. Yeah, we'll probably yeah. be doing something. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, you guys, that is Mr. Ben Ratner, obviously doing some amazing things, full of knowledge. If you're looking for a speaker, a video producer, a live streaming producer for your next, next show... Talk to that man over there. He knows his stuff. He knows it. He knows it. He knows. But P.S. By the way, like, are you? <laughs> oh my God, are you speaking any other time this year? Or is that it? Conference season is done. Um, I don't think I have anything scheduled at this point. Um, if you want me to, again, I love talking about me and other things that aren't me. So, <laughs> well, let's get you to Facebook F8 because I would, I would totally love to see you just corner one of like the product managers for live video. Be like. Stop messing with the API. I would totally make that into a gift. That's good. All right, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah, Dean, Mike, everyone. Amanda. Happy birthday, awesome. Chris. Happy birthday, Chris. Okay. Bye, y'all.